Uh, you know, I, I sense more smiles around at the moment, so I'm, I'm not going to spoil this by talking about the market. We've got a really good panel here who have um, lots of views. And so what I, I wanted to do in my 15 minutes this afternoon was talk to you about uh, another topic, um, and one which I, I think has been very much on my mind uh, in the last 6, 12 months, and which has led me to some conclusions um, that I didn't really expect to reach, and I'd like to share those with you. The, the title of my um, topic formally is uh, The Future of Shipping, but the, the theme I'm going to address is um, af what happens after smart shipping, uh, or after um, eco-ships. And the, um, the, the reason I wanted to talk about this was that, um, well, it's been introduced very well in the previous session, um, where we, we heard about the cloud, about the new communications that are available. And there's, the, what I'm going to say to you is that I think that after 150 years of naval architects and marine engineers working really hard to improve the efficiency of the ships that we use, that particular road, that particular cupboard is now empty. There isn't very much left in the cupboard, and we have to look somewhere else for the, the improvements in efficiency that we're going to get in future. Um, and so, you know, my theme really is that um, after eco ships, we should be looking for smart shipping. And what I'm going to suggest is that smart shipping will go to the heart of another topic that was discussed very forcibly, um, Captain Paniotis, this morning. The whole, the, the issue that I hear most as I wander around the shipping industry is, who are the people who are going to run the, run the business in 10, 15 years' time? Who, where are we going to get the chief engineers, the electrical engineers, to actually run the business? You heard the debate before lunch uh, quite a few times. And I think that smart shipping, that I'm going to talk to you about, is not going to be just about the digital revolution. It's going to be about a different way of organizing the businesses that we run, and that will actually address directly the question of how you make shipping a business which has a career prospect for the bright young men that the shipping minister was taught, young men and women that the shipping minister was talking about this morning. Because you can train people till they're blue in the face, but if you can't get them into the industry, if you can't give them a career prospect beyond um, the next couple of years, then you won't keep them. The idea that you become a, an engineer and you're 30, 40 years later you're still an engineer doesn't work today. So that's, that's my theme. I've used up four of my minutes, so I've got to get a move on. Um, the, um, the person I think who, uh, a person who inspires me a lot on this, and I have to admire, although I'm not sure what sort of guy he was, but he, he has had, Steve Jobs had something in which I think he shares with Greek ship owners. He had the capacity to look at, uh, the, see the potential in things which others didn't see. And a, a good example of this was in, in the late 1970s, he went to the Xerox, gave a presentation at their research. They had a heavyweight research um, lab in Paco Alto, uh, Paco Alto in um, California. And they were demonstrating this sort of great, I'm going to get rid of that, this, this block thing on the end of a wire. And this block, which was about this big and, and cost $300, moved a cursor on the screen of the computer. And he got at the break, at the coffee break, he got really excited about that. And he went away. Three or four years later, he, got, he redesigned the concept. It became the mouse. And he did it for $15, not uh, $300. And out of that came the whole GUI interface that we all work in today. He saw it immediately, within seconds. And I think the, the, the thing that, 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 in a sense, we need to see and share some of his vision about how the shipping industry can put the digital revolution to work. Well, we all tend to come into the shipping business today through cycles. We're going to have a look. And um, 
I, I've just put on the chart here, you can see uh, the 23 shipping cycles since 1741, a bit before my time. Um, but um, that, that was actually five years before um, uh, the, the Lloyd's Coffee House was set up in London. They come in every size. You can't imagine the pain, the losses, the bankruptcies, the fortunes that were made along these cycles. But actually, under the, under the surface of these cycles, there was something else going on. And if we deflate these freight rates, we, re we remove the inflation, we get another chart, which looks like this. This is the same uh, freight rates, but deflated to take account. Of, I used a dollar index, a dollar deflation index. And you see that in, from 1741 to 1814, freight rates actually went up. I hope, yes, you can see that just about, I hope. I hope you can see this at the back. Um, the reason for that was they were using sailing ships. The, the wood was getting more expensive because they were cutting up all the trees. It took 3,000 trees to make a warship, and Britain was at war with France, so there was no trees left. And then something really amazing happened. We got the fossil fuels revolution, and from about 1830 onwards, that line starts to go downward. It went down fr uh, from... Uh, there to 1910 as the steam engines got better and the hulls got better. And then we had another round of improvements from 1950 to 1990 as the big oil companies and the steel mills took us into the supership revolution. The, uh, they, we went from a 17,000 ton tanker in 1947 to a 300,000 ton, ton tanker by 1975. And that gave us another round, economies of scale, more efficient diesel engines gave us another reduction in the cost of freight. So that index went up from 2,000 to 2,500. Then for the next 150 years, it went from 2,500 down to about 200. And since 200, if you just look at that there, you see, it started to go up again. And if we just home in on this, you can see this is this, that little bit at the end blown up. You see that the index from 1950, it went down from um, seven, 650 down to around 150. Since then, it has gone up again. And the, uh, the reason that it's gone up is that we've run out of technology to improve the industry. Over that long period, we went from this, a 200-ton sailing ship. You couldn't build a bigger ship out of wood to the first real serious deep-sea um, liner, which was the Agamemnon. Um, this was built in 1865 by Alfred Holt. He was a sort of Steve Jobs type, type of figure. He put the naval architecture of the day together with the marine engineering of the day, and he built the first ship that could get to, to India only having 20% of its cargo space carrying bunker coal. And you, you, actually what might appeal to you actually about this was that he paid 56,000 pounds for the ship, in 1865. In 1869, he took one cargo of tea from China to Europe, and he got 28,000 pounds for that one cargo of tea. So even in those days, if you built the right high-tech ship at the right time, you could make a killing, and I hope that will, uh, will inspire you. And then, of course, today, we've got to the, um, the, the, the Tripoli ships, very, very big, but this is where we come into the problem. The trouble is that the two big drivers of this improvement, more efficient engines and bigger ships, are running out of steam. And let me just go through these quickly. First of all, the engines are, have stopped getting more efficient. Look at this. This is the, fuel, the kilos of fuel consumed per 1,000 ton miles of cargo since 1855. So it was 89 in 1855. By uh, 1915, it was down to 17.7. By 2014, the Triple E, it's about 2.6. So we've really reduced it. But if you look at the ships that have been built since 1980, in fact, 
uh, this chart, what I did was download all the 60,000 ton ships uh, built since 1965 for which I had speed and consumption. I standardized the speed at 14 and a half knots, adjusted the consumption, and you can see that the, these ships that we're, we've been building in the last 30 years don't improve in fuel efficiency. And if we take a look at the, I, I took the six latest Japanese eco ship Supramax designs, 50 to 60,000 60, ton designs, 28 tons per day. It's fine tuning. This, this is not in the scale of the sort of improvements we've produced in the past. As far as a container ship, as economies of scale are concerned, you know, this chart, again, I took the whole fleet of container ships and I looked at the relationship between the size of the ship and the fuel consumption. You get a massive improvement in fuel consumption uh, per thousand ton miles at, until you get to about 8,000 TU, then it goes pretty flat. So, you can, I'm not saying you can't get more efficient, but it's not the sort of efficiencies. And the trouble is the bigger ships have disadvantages. For one thing, it's harder to load them. It's harder to get a full deadweight utilization. How do, you, well, how do you deal with this? Well, this is where smart shipping comes in. If you, uh, and there's a slight complication here because the sort of things that you can d get out of smart shipping are to do with quality control. In fact, they were, they, they've been mentioned in the previous panel. I thought it was a great, a great session. Uh, but if we take the uh, automation of cars, then according to Morgan Stanley, there's a $1.3 billion saving on um, the Google if, if you get the self-driver, the driverless car, of which 38% is less accidents. Computers just don't run into things, you know. Um, I'm not going to mention the case, but there is a very, very expensive insurance case that's been mentioned today where there was half an hour between the accident happening and action being taken. Computers don't take half an hour to make decisions. So there are, there are issues here in the automation which go way beyond the, the usual concept is, oh, well, we don't, we, you can't have a driverless ship. Well, it isn't about a driverless ship. It's about better quality control because you're systemizing the organization of this stuff. Now, I, I've only got two and a half minutes, so I'm going to run through the last bit very quickly. How do you do it? Well, you've already heard quite a bit of it, but the first thing you do is, and um, in fact, uh, the, um, e e e so the, the European ship owners mentioned this this morning. Um, you standardize interfaces. When you take your BMW into the garage nowadays, they don't get out a spanner. They plug it into the computer. The computer di diagnoses what's wrong. You, have st you plug in a new standard circuit board. You've de-skilled that job in many ways. As long as you know what to do, you're plugging in parts. The basic engineering of the engines and stuff is so good nowadays that that, that, the, that the mechanics don't fail, it's the consequential stuff, it's the valve that fails. And again, we heard a lot about the use of transponders in the previous session and the ability to beam this information around the world. The second thing is you actually automate the operations. And this is where you don't just automate navigation, you automate, you, you do the navigation, you do the onboard operations, you do the admin systems. And again, as we heard, the bandwidth, the data speeds, they're all getting better. This is coming within our grasp if you want to do it. And finally, you centralize analysis. I was talking to a container owner the other day, uh, actually dinner last week, and um, uh, he got 50 ships. And I said, how many really good chief engineers you got on those ships? And he said, well, maybe 10. So what could be more logical than to put your really skilled guys in the office and you beam the actual, you monitor the analysis, the performance of the ships, you're running constant KPIs, you're acting immediately, you're, and if you do that, then maybe you can put quite junior and inexperienced people on the ship, you know, m marine engineering graduates with two years experience, they're in charge of the engine room. That's what young people want, they want quick experience, but you need, the systems remove the risk. 
you wouldn't dream of doing that in today's system because you need to have knocked around the engine room for 30 years to find out what goes wrong. If you've got a, a, an automated system, then in fact you do that. And the second thing you do is you have the opportunity to break down the barrier between ship and shore and to create a team, a whole team um, spirit, which means that people who come into the business can actually follow a career. You can offer them two years here, two years there, two years somewhere else, a bit on the ship, a bit at shore. This is the sort of thing that you build a whole new culture about and you run the, the fleet. My time's up. You, you run the fleet as a team, not as, well, whatever you run it as at the moment. So tomorrow's shipping is about ships, cargo, but most of all, it's about people. Uh, the ship technology revolution is running out of steam. The reason for doing this is that there is no other big revolution in town. town. This is it. Number two, smart shipping is about people. It's not about ships. Most companies have far more people at sea than on land. It's a resource that has to be used better. If, you, if you've got 300, 400 people on the water and maybe 20 people on land, you're probably not using your major resource properly. And the third thing is that the digital revolution offers a realistic way of linking fleet of ships into a real-time management unit. Well, I know that's not what you expected to hear. I haven't told you what the dry cargo market's going to do. But I'd, you know, you've given me the privilege of talking to you for 15 minutes. I've thought about this for quite a long time. And I, I don't say I'm right, but I do hope some of you will go away and think about it and, uh, and maybe um, be able to make a little bit of, of your build a little of, for something of yourself on these ideas. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.